Hey, good morning, Brother Clinton here. Praise the Lord. Welcome to my apartment once again. I want to share with you something from the scripture, and it's something that a lot of people in the churches are confused about, something that I was confused about for many years, and I began to ask God some questions when I was reading the scripture. Um, all of a sudden, some things just didn't make sense, and I began to say, well, Lord, what about this? Why does the scripture say this? But I was always thinking that this was the case, and he opened up the scripture to me and showed me, and that's what I'm going to do for you today. Not in the same way that God can, because only God can reveal it to you. But I'm going to open up the word of God and share it with you. And I believe that if you're submitted to God, that you will hear his word. And that when we share these two passages of scripture, you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. This video is not going to be exhaustive. And it's not going to go into as great a detail as an epistle that I have on my website, the Sword of the Valiant website. This epistle is called, Who's Lucifer? And I'm going to put a link to that below the video right here so that you can go to it and check it out. And it will give you in detail uh, the scripture that talks about this subject so that you can search the scriptures for yourself. This video is kind of like a little kind of trying to make you think about it. Uh, teaser, so to speak. Uh, teaser is not a good word, but uh, something to kind of make you think about it so that you will have a greater desire to search the scriptures about this and come to the knowledge of the truth concerning the identity of Lucifer. Um, we're going to go into the scripture. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. We're going to read from the 14th chapter of Isaiah. <coughs> Pardon me. From the 14th chapter of Isaiah and also from the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. There are other passages in the scripture that are going to be relevant to this subject, but these two passages are the, the, the most prominent and clear indicators in the scripture of who Lucifer is. And it's very important for us to understand this, because if it's in the Bible, that means God wants us to know it. The name Lucifer is in the Bible one time, and it's in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Okay, so we're going to start with Isaiah chapter 14. And before I start reading, I want to kind of give you an, a, a summary in advance, if there is such a thing, of this chapter. Verse, chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, describe the setting for the rest of the chapter. And then verses 4 through 23 describe a parable that will be spoken out of the mouths of the children of Israel at a time in the future when Jesus Christ will have been sitting on the throne of Jerusalem in his kingdom, ruling over Jerusalem and Israel and over all the nations of the earth. And verses 4 through 23 are a parable that will be spoken by the people of Israel at that time. And the reason that I know that is because verses 1 through 4 set that clearly and it's, that's very important for us to understand so let's get into the scripture and once again may God bless the reading of his word it says for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and then I'm going to go back over them a little bit and the people shall take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from thy heart, excuse me, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say. And I'm going to stop in the middle of the verse right there because. This is the passage that we want to kind of take a look at for a minute before we continue. Let's start again at verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. Okay, has that happened yet? Since this was spoken? Well, this was spoken about 700 and something B.C. by the mouth of Isaiah the prophet. And at that time, Israel was already dwelling in their own land. And then they were taken captive to Babylon for a while. And they did come back to their own land. But we're going to see from the rest of this passage of Scripture that the things that Isaiah was talking about here have not come to pass yet. Okay, Israel did come back to their own land. But the rest of this passage of Scripture didn't come to pass at that time and still hasn't come to pass yet. It says in the end of verse 1, And strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Strangers. Goyim in Hebrew, Gentiles, Gentiles shall be joined with them and shall cleave to the house of Jacob. That didn't happen in the days 
after Israel returned to Israel or the land of Israel from their captivity. Okay, that didn't happen. It hasn't happened yet. Okay, there is a gospel which will join anyone into the church of Jesus Christ, whether they be Jew or Gentile, but there has not come a time yet when Gentiles, strangers, have been joined with the house of Israel and cleaved to the house of Jacob and gathered together in that land. That hasn't happened yet. Verse 2, And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. Okay, so the people of the strangers of the lands, the people that are Gentiles, the people that are not Israel, shall take those people of Israel that are scattered abroad in their lands and bring them, transport them, to the land of Israel. And after they transport them to the land of Israel, these people, that these strangers, these Gentiles that transported them will become servants to the Israelites. Listen. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them. When you possess someone, that means that they're your slave, your personal property, your servant. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord. That's Israel, the land of Israel. For servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were. And they shall rule over their oppressors. Okay. Since this was written by the hand of Isaiah the prophet, it has not yet come to pass. But it will come to pass. It will surely come to pass. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. Oh, and look at what it says in verse 3. And it shall come to pass. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, which is what he was just talking about in verses 1 and 2 that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say. So now verses 1 through 4 tell us that the time is coming when the strangers of the world, the Gentiles of the world, shall take the Jews that are in their countries who have been scattered abroad and bring them to the land of Jerusalem. And those people that brought them there shall become servants and handmaids to the people of Israel. They will join themselves to the house of Israel, cleave to them, and they shall be their servants. And when that happens, and it hasn't happened yet, but when that does happen, which is going to be when Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne, we can read that in other places in the scripture, but I'm not going to go there right now because I don't want to make this video too long. It says, when that happens, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say. So now, from verse 4 to verse 23 is the fullness of this proverb, this saying that the people of Israel are going to be saying, at that time. It's very important for us to understand that fact, that truth. Now here's the proverb that they're going to be speaking. How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come against us, is come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword, 
that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. <clears throat> I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. This is a parable that will be taken up in the mouths of the people of Israel in the time that Jesus Christ will be sitting on his throne ruling over all the nations. And the people of Israel will possess for servants and handmaids those who once possessed them. And this parable is concerning a man. It's obvious that from the scripture that it's concerning a man. I mean, look at um, verse 16. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming, and stirreth up the dead for thee. Verse 9. Um, verse 19. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. This, I mean, for I will rise up against them. Uh, verse 22, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. This is talking about Lucifer. And at the same time we know that it's talking about Lucifer, someone called Lucifer, we can see obviously from the scripture that there's nothing in this whole passage of scripture that seems to be referring to an angel. But it is referring to a man. That's very important for us to understand. Because Satan is not a man. Satan is an angel. And we're going to see that as we go to the book of Ezekiel. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 28, and it's important to read Ezekiel chapters 20, 26, 27, and 28, because they're all basically talking about the same thing, but chapter 28 gives us descriptions of two different personalities. In verses 2 through 10, I believe, verses 2 through 10, the scripture talks about someone called the Prince of Tyrus. And in verses 11 through 19, it talks about someone called the King of Tyrus. <clears throat> now a prince is the son of a king. A king is greater than a prince. Okay. So first the scripture talks about someone called the Prince of Tyrus. And in verses 2 through 10, it's obvious that the person that's being spoken of here is a man. And we're going to see that in a moment. And in verses 11 through 19, it's obvious that the king of Tyrus, whoever is being spoken of here and being referred to as the king of Tyrus, is not a man, but that he is an angel. There's a very important difference there. So let's read. And again, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Ezekiel 20, chapter 28, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Okay, that makes it pretty clear that this is speaking of a man. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, and this is where Paul got his revelation from that he wrote in, in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians concerning this son of perdition. Okay, this is a man, and this man is called Lucifer. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Okay. An angel would have no use for the such things as that. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, traffic is business. Okay. Those of you who don't know, traffic means commerce. By thy great wisdom and thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. In other words, because you have imagined in your heart that you are a God. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. What good is it going to do for men to draw swords against an angel? 
no good at all. But to draw swords against a man who is flesh is very uh, dangerous, very pernicious. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Thou shalt die the deaths, plural, of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. This man is one who will either be risen from the dead or will, who will be fooling the world into thinking that he's risen from the dead. And that's revealed other places in the scripture, particularly in the 17th chapter of the Revelation and also in the book of Daniel. Wilt thou, say, wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken and saith the Lord God. So this is obviously speaking about a man, a human man, a human male. Okay, He is a man. The scripture says he is a man. The scripture says that he will be slain with a sword and will die the deaths of the uncircumcised, which also means that he is a Jewish man because the Lord is going to cause him to die the deaths of the uncircumcised. The Lord would only speak that way to a Jewish man. Nobody else would care about being circumcised or uncircumcised. But this is a Jewish man who have rejected the God of his fathers and will die the deaths of the uncircumcised. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus, the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Wait a minute, this is not talking about a man. The only man in Eden was Adam. And um, Adam wasn't covered with precious stones. So this is not talking about a man. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Wow, that sure is not Adam. But it was someone who was in the garden. In the garden of God. And we know of a truth that the only man in the garden of God was Adam. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Well, there it is right there. He's a cherub. A cherub is an angel. He's not a man. Okay, angels are spirits. Men are souls. There's a very clear difference. Angels are not men. Men are not angels. Angels have appeared as men and can appear as men, but they are not men. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And the stones of fire are, of course, the elect angels. We can see that from Psalm 104, verse 4, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You can look those up if you like. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore will I cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. I will cast thee from the midst of the stones of fire, I'll cast thee out of heaven. And that's what God spoke about in the 12th chapter of the Revelation, which is something that will happen in the future from now. Satan will be cast out of heaven and his angels with him. Hallelujah. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Let me just go over to the 12th chapter of the Revelation real quick and show you what God is talking about that he said he was going to do. This is something that's going to happen in the future. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and seven through 9. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There's no misunderstanding what's being spoken of there. The dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. Well, those are words that mean the same person. Verse 19, chapter, Ezekiel 28, 19. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Praise the Lord. So the first half, pardon me, the first half of Ezekiel 28, verses 2 through 10, 
1 through 10, are talking about a man called the Prince of Tyrus. Verses 11 through 19 are talking about an angel called the King of Tyrus. These two are two entirely different personalities. They're two entirely different beings. The first one, in verses 1 through 10, is a man who will exalt himself as God. And even as Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, he will exalt himself. Let me just read that for you. Praise the Lord, because I don't want to misquote it. And then shall that wicked be revealed. I'm going to back up a little bit. Verse 3, first, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Man, man of sin, okay, not an angel, not Satan, a man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That sounds familiar. Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Ezekiel 28.2 That's where Paul got that from. This is a man. And if we go back to Isaiah chapter 14 now, we can see clearly that Lucifer is a man. This parable that the people of Israel will take up in their mouths in the day that Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne, and they'll be looking back on the time when this man, who is called Antichrist, the son of perdition, was ruling over the nations and, and killing the people of God and changing the times and laws and causing the people to come under the government of his whim, will have been destroyed by the breath of the mouth of Jesus Christ the Lord, and will have been cast into hell. And they're going to say, Whoa, who is this man now? How, are, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The people of Israel are going to be saying this in hindsight, looking back upon this one who called himself the Almighty God, but he was just a man. This man of sin, son of perdition, who exalted himself above all that is called God. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. I'm in Isaiah 14 right now. I just read verse 5. I'm going to continue. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted, and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Since you're gone, Lucifer, man of sin, son of perdition, O shining one, the one that proclaimed yourself to be the almighty God, since you're gone, the whole earth is at rest. Yea, they break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Even the land itself rejoices, because the land is defiled. The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, it says in the 24th chapter of Isaiah. Verse 9, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. Okay, this is where you went, O Lucifer, son of the morning, the, the man that, that did shake the nations. You went into the lower parts of the earth with all the chief ones of the nations, all the, all the leaders of the nations who are working under the God of this world, working against the Lord Jesus Christ. All the kings and the presidents and the rulers of the nations who were part of that global government, part of that global community, gathered together in oppressing the people and working against the kingdom of God. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All the kings of the nations are going to meet you there, son of perdition. Hallelujah. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? You? You who, who, for whom we prepared the stage and set the stage for centuries so that you could come and rule over all the earth, now you're here with us? In hell? Are you no stronger than that? We thought that you were the Almighty God. You proclaimed yourself to be the Almighty God in the flesh. What about it? Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. No angel. It could not be said of any angel that, that his pomp is brought down to the grave. 
No angel can go to the grave. They have no body, no, no physical flesh and blood body to be buried in the ground. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. This is flesh. Obviously, this is flesh. And then it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is Lucifer? It is a name that means the shining one. It means to shine, to be bright, to make a show of yourself, a spectacle of yourself. It means to act like Hulk Hogan when uh, when you used to turn on WWF wrestling and there would be the, the lights and the, and the sparkling disco ball and the red velvet carpeting and the big costumes and with many colors and all the pomp and the glory of this man who was nothing but 100, 200 pounds of, of flesh who caused all this glory to be shined on himself so that he seemed like something glorious. That's what Lucifer means. It means one who exalts himself and, and makes himself bright and shining so that everybody thinks that he's something that he's not. That's what Lucifer means, praise the Lord. And this is why they're calling him that in hindsight, because he made himself God when he was not a God at all. He was just a man. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How art thou fallen from heaven? Oh, my goodness, the children of Israel are going to say, Oh, what a shame that you fell from heaven, you who thought you would exalt yourself unto the stars of God and sit on the sides of the north and proclaim that you are a God. Oh, what a bummer that you have fallen from heaven and now you're in hell. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Son of the morning? Look in 1 Samuel 2 20, or look in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and, and, and see how David himself said that the rule he that rules over men would be like the son of the morning. Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star, and this man, the son of perdition, pretended to be that morning star. He pretended to be that son of the morning, and the people of Israel are going to say, Oh, bummer that you have fallen into hell. We thought you were the son of the morning. You said you were. Oh, wow, you're, you mean you're not really God? What a bummer that you have fallen from the height of heaven. You son of the morning, and now you're in hell. Oh, what a bummer. Imagine that. They're being sarcastic, and they're taking up this parable against this man who exalted himself to be God over all the earth and at the time that they're saying this he will have been cast down into hell because Jesus Christ will have come and deposed him with the mighty breath of his mouth hallelujah how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations for thou hast said in thine heart I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God above the stars of God, above the angels, to rule over angels and men. This man said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That is the throne that belongs to Jesus Christ. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is what this man said. And now he's fallen. As the children of Israel are saying in this time, they're looking back on him, and he will have fallen from that lofty position where he tried to exalt himself to, that he couldn't attain to, because no man can attain to that position except the one that God has ordained, of which he said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ, hallelujah. Verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Hallelujah. This is a man, look, Verse 16, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? It's a man. Lucifer is a man. It is a name that will be given in hindsight in a parable by the children of Israel when Jesus Christ is sitting on his throne to a man who once thought to exalt himself as God and rule over the nations and will have at that time been deposed by the mighty power of God and made manifest before the whole world that he is not a God but that he is a man and he will have been cast into hell and this is a parable that will be in the mouths of the children of Israel at that time when this man the son of perdition will have been cast into hell after having told the world that he was the almighty God so we can see from the scripture clearly and I would like you very much to go to the epistle that is um, linked at the bottom of this video and it will go into much more detail and much more passage, many more passages of the scripture and it will show you conclusively that Lucifer is a man. Lucifer is not Satan. 
Satan is an angel, a spirit. Angels are spirits. See, the Bible says God maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. But man is not a spirit. Man is a living soul. Okay, God breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living soul. Man is a soul. Angels are spirits. And so it's clear from the scripture that Lucifer is not Satan. It is also clear from the scripture that the time that Satan will be cast out of heaven is not yet. But the time is coming when Satan will be cast out of heaven and his angels with him. And when that happens, he will be made manifest. And the kings of the earth will be able to see him. He will be cast to the ground, cast into the earth. And people will be able to see him. And for that reason, he is coming with great wrath because he will know that his time is short, as the scripture says. Praise the Lord. So please go to the epistle and check it out. Study these things. There's a reason that God wants you to know this. There's a reason why the denominations have lied to you and told you that Lucifer and Satan are the same person. There's a reason that they lied to you and told you that Satan was cast out of heaven before he met Adam in the Garden of Eden. That's a lie. That's not true at all. Satan is in heaven. Satan can go to the throne of God. He can go anywhere between there and the earth. Look in the book of Job. Uh, God said to Satan, um, Whence comest thou? And, and he said, From wandering to and fro throughout the earth. And at the time, he was at the throne of God saying this. And so Satan can go anywhere from, Satan's domain is anywhere from the kingdom of heaven at the throne of God um, to the surface of the earth. And anywhere in the heavens, he is wandering about in, in the heavens, in, in high and heavenly places. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, that he is the god of this world. He is not cast into hell. Satan is not in hell. Satan has a lot of power right now, and I'm not exalting him or anything because he is, he is judged already. But we should at the same time not ever underestimate the power that he holds, lest we be ensnared by that and, and, and come back into um, servitude unto the one from whence we have been redeemed. So praise the Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ, for the power of his word, for the truth of his word, for the anointing of his spirit, and for the light that is sown for the righteous. May this video, this message be a blessing to you. Please go to the website and check out the epistle. It's going to go into much more detail and answer a lot of questions. But if you still have questions, you're welcome to uh, comment on this video or write me a PM. And I hope this has been a blessing to you, and I hope that you will take this and meditate on it and get a revelation of it from the Lord and then spread it unto others in the churches as well. Because there's no reason for people that believe that they're Christians to believe that Satan is Lucifer, to believe that Satan has already been cast out of heaven, that he was cast out of heaven before he met Adam in the Garden of Eden. Those things are just not true. There's also no reason for Christians to believe that Satan is in hell. That's just not true either. So we need to get the truth of the word in us and all speak the same thing. And that's how we're going to get the true message out to those who are perishing. Peace to you.